The sponsor of my stream and podcast is DistroKid. If you want Sam percent off on your first subscription with DistroKid, release your music to the world on every major music platform. Make sure to go to my website, andrewvanzart.com, and click on the discount link under the tab of DistroKid. Attention, Sarkarians. Embark on a cosmic journey at www.andrewvanzart.com. Saving by clicking on our affiliate tab. Discounts await. Your click not only unlocks deals, but supports the beats and discussions of these stellar radio stations. At Jetway Radio. Join the Sith and let the unlimited power of the discounts await you in the shopping. And for you musicians to get a discount on DistroKid. www.andrewvanzart.com Your portal to savings. May the discounts be with you. The information on this podcast is my opinion and some internet research. The galaxy's most popular movie is great family entertainment. Like Chair Radio, I'm Adam Zark, and this is your safe space with Miss Towers, music, and other geeky topics. So, today's episode is going to be dedicated to the one and only Phantom Menace. I rewatched it on the movie theater, and my god, was it really good! So, most of the music is going to be like similar to what Nabu sounds like. Um, so, we're going to have a lot of fun. But before we get started with anything, um, let's get ourselves started with the uh, main song that everybody recognizes from Phantom Menace, and it's Dual, Dual Faith, you know? But we're not going to get the regular version. We're going to get the Samuel Kim version. So let's listen to it. Let's have some fun. Let's go. Alrighty, let's get ourselves started here. So, I wanted to start off the show by saying that the 25th anniversary of of Star Wars with The Phantom Menace was amazing. I'm kind of sad I missed out on the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. I'm really sad about that one. I would have loved to have gone to that one. But, you know, that was a really shorter uh, event. For some reason, I didn't saw that much of a hype for the 40th anniversary of of Star Wars Return of the Jedi. I don't understand why wasn't it a thing. You know? I would have loved for it to have a bit more of an exposure. At least uh, from my brother's side, I do have a hat that says uh, 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. I think it says both at some point of the hat. Um, so yeah, that's at least I got some merch from that. I think it's my brother's favorite one, Return of the Jedi. 
because that's where we do get to see a lot of Boba Fett in many shapes and forms, you know? So, yeah. But well, we're going to uh, enjoy ourselves awesome music here in uh, Gotcha Radio. And uh, we're going to make ourselves feel like we're part of Naboo at this point in time. And Naboo, for me, feels like nature sounds, you know, nature ambience, nature, you know. You know, and um, I would love if we could go for some, you know, water, water, like waterfall sounds for this point in time, for this first one. Um... So we're going to go for a little bit of a river sound at this point in time, and from there move on to other uh, topics. So we're going to go with natural river, and from there we'll move on to more information of what I have to say from the 25th anniversary of the Phantom Menace. Hello and welcome back from that awesome music break and uh, this is Andrew Benzark once again here. Um, so, Star Wars. It's interesting how 25 years later, again I repeat myself, 25 years later, The Phantom Menace takes second place at Domestic Box Office. I find that really interesting for being a 25-year-old film that we've seen countless of times on DVD, on VHS, on on remastered versions, uh, original versions, uh, on Disney+, Plus, clips here and there on on, on YouTube or on on social media. We've experienced The Phantom Menace a million and countless of times. But for some reason... It became the second most domestic box office. It takes it. It takes it to second place, you know? So, The Phantom Menace 25th Anniversary released earned 8.8 million at the domestic box office this weekend. Taking the second slot behind the Fall Guys, its global reach 14.48 million, you know? Trust me, if The Phantom Menace has done amazing, and at this point in time, we're, we're waiting for um, the 25th anniversary of the clone, Attack of the Clones, 
to then have finally uh, the epic conclusion of the prequels, Revenge of the Sith, the best one of them all. Oof, that's going to take first place. That's going to be insane. That's going to be crazy. All those are going to be crazy once we re-release them on the theater. Hope this continues being a trend because Phantom Man has proved to be a really good film to re-release on the th on the theaters. And it shows you that no matter how old the film is, Star Wars fans stick together. I remember when uh, The Return of the Jedi 40th Anniversary came out. They did a humongous event on my one of my biggest shopping centers in Puerto Rico. Um, like, I saw a lot of rebels. Like, people dressed as, you know, rebel pilots for some reason. And rebel fighters. With the, with the helmets and everything, you know. And I was like, whoa. And I saw one single person dressed as a Luke Skywalker. And that was amazing. I don't, rem I don't remember if I saw someone dressed as Palpatine. Or Palpatine. I don't really know. I, I heard an audiobook and, and it was saying Palpatine. I don't even understand why. Anyways, the thing, the thing is that... Um, that was that was amazing. That was crazy. You know? And... I wasn't even aware... That people still would go to the theater to watch a really old film just for the fact that you know it's 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 a it's a cult classic, you know. It's a fan favorite. Same happened with the Phantom Menace. And I, I even saw people around me going like, "Yo, this is crazy." And we all know how the dual fates happens. We all know that Qui Gon Jinn gets stabbed and killed. We all know that at some point, Obi-Wan gets really mad out of that situation and slices and have Darth Maul. We all know that happens. But for some reason, that point in time of the film keeps us straight stick to the screen. And honestly, honestly, if I, if I have to say so myself, I think that the theater is the best place for the films of Star Wars. Not the, not the TV shows. TV shows can probably live on the, on the small screen. In the video games, they don't have to be played in big screens and the humongous around. But the films, ooh, the pot raising scenes, amazing on big screen. Like, you get emerged. You know, I remember when I saw this as a little kid in 1999. I was born in 1994, you do the math. But I do remember, I do remember, I went with my aunt and my cousin. And I think. My cousins, uh, uh, sisters and shit. But anyways, the thing is, that I remember going there, and then right after going to Toys R Us to get myself lightsabers. You know, cheap, fake, plastic lightsabers. Not the awesome LED lights, uh, lightsabers that we have nowadays. No, cheap plastic that they would break easy after a few swings and hitting uh, each other. But I remember, I don't remember if I got Qui-Gon's uh, lightsaber, or I got... Um, Darth Maul's lightsaber. I don't remember, but it was one of those two. I was amazed with the uh, character of uh, Liam Neeson, you know, Qui-Gon when I was a kid, but what captivated me the most was having Darth Maul right there. I, it was amazing. It was, it was like, the best thing I, I have uh, acknowledged in, in, in so long. And till this day, till this day, I'm still a huge fan of Darth Maul, and I met and I met the the, the the actor that did Darth Maul, not not face to face, but I went to a conference and I had a like an experience with the Ray Parker, and it's amazing how Ray Parker did his own stunts, no doubles, no anything. Anyways, let's continue listening to some more music here in Galactic Radio, and we're gonna listen to Naboo Garden with the song Phantom Menace.
variety. So I got breaking news and awesome stuff. Today we got released a trailer for none other than Star Wars Rebuild. And there is something that I'm completely, like, like totally, completely baffled about. Like, hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Darth Jar Jar Binks. I repeat myself. Darth Jar Jar Binks is real. And he can hurt the user. Just, just saying. Just saying. You know, it's been pondered all around the internet. Like, really badly, really all over the place, the whole idea of Darth Jar Jar Binks, you know. And the whole idea of Darth Jar Jar Binks comes in because if you see the prequels, you can see at some point that the actions of Jar Jar Binks actually takes Palpatine to a further uh, a step to fulfill his uh, plans. And this is why for so long we've been like, you must have been a Darth Jar Jar Binks uh, somehow. You must have been a Darth somehow. Because no apprentice, no anything. We still haven't seen like the in-between of well, Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. There's a gap in there. There's clearly a gap in there. And... Uh, Papa team must have used the Jar Jar Binks at some extent, you know? So, Darth Jar Jar Binks was now officially released by Disney. And, and no, those of you that say, no, to let go, it's not really canon. Uh uh uh. Uh uh uh. Again, uh uh uh. Legos are as canon as your mainline stuff. Simple as that. So Disney Plus animated special Lego Star Wars Rebuild. The galaxy's revealed a menacing, hilarious Sith Lord. None other than Jar Jar Binks bringing to life a fan theory. Oh, I, I'm, I'm all up for this. I am all up for this, you know. So let's get it all running. Yeah, yeah all righty. I'm actually really stoked and intrigued. So, from the official description, you know, the premise for the special is that Star Wars Galaxy gets completely mixed up with an ordinary nerf herder, Sig Gribbling, you know, Gaiden Matarazu, unearths a powerful artifact from a hidden Jedi temple. He finds himself thrust into adventure in a new, wondrously wild and twisted version of the galaxy. Where good guys are bad guys, you know, are, you know, and the bad guys are just good. And the fate of all depends on Sigs becoming the hero who can put all the pieces back together. But I'm actually pretty stoked and intrigued about this. I, I think that it should have been a thing uh, ages ago because I, I actually saw it. I actually, I actually believed it. I actually was like, Wow, and I actually have an old episode of my radio show where I talked about it, you know, when it used to be called Star Wars Chatter. But, wow. <laughs> so, I, I'm completely amazed. I'm completely amazed and I feel satisfied that this became a reality. You know, they're probably, because it's, it's a Lego, you know, it's Lego. They're probably going to twist it into a comedic uh, kind of thing, but, you know... It's, it's, it's still Darth Jar Jar Binks. We're, we're seeing from an official release the media, Darth Jar Jar Binks. They made my childhood. My, not my child, my teenage years, because I, I figured out how halfway through the teenage years that some people were theorizing that Jar Jar Binks could be Darth. But I wasn't that really into that, the, the, the theorizing stuff yet. And it's not until a few years ago that I was, like, really into theorizing things because, let's face it, my, my love for Star Wars was just watch the films and watch the parodies. I wouldn't, I wasn't really going, like, in depth with, oh, what if this is this and this is that, like I do now. But I was just enjoying the films countless of times on, on traditional TV and some of them on DVD. 
I remember I used to replay um, Revenge of the Sith so many times on DVD. But this Gungan character named the Jar Jar Bings, as we've been talking about him, was released in 1999. Lots of people hated it. The the actor that did Jar Jar Bings almost committed suicide. I'm glad he didn't. Um, so let's let's all have some fun, you know. Jar Jar Binks, am I right? Jar Jar Binks. Now he's a fucking Darth. <laughs> uh, Jar Jar. He's the call Jar Jar Binks. Jar 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 Binks. He's the your humble servant. Jar 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 Binks. Day with a brisky morning munching, then boom! Getting very scared and grabbing that she's on it now. He's right here, he's the call Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar, Jar Jar, Jar Jar Binks. Oh, Mooey Mooey, I love you. Jar Jar, Jar Jar Binks. He's the call Jar Jar Binks. Ah, uh, Jar Jar Binks. You're such a funny little creature. And his fighting style actually is a uh, fun fact here. It's uh, reminiscent and was inspired by the Drunken Fist. You know, Drunken Fist is a is a style of fighting that the Asians, specifically the Chinese, would mix being drunk with Kung Fu. <laughs> so that's all about it. Just get drunk and uh, have some uh, some of that stuff, you know. Hope you all get to, to, at some point, check out Jar Jar Binks. Uh, all the, all the fun facts out of Jar Jar Binks, you know? Jar Jar Binks has so many fun facts and, and so many shapes and forms that I still don't understand why people hated it, you know? Jar Jar Binks was not really the character for your average Joe. Jar Jar Binks was there to entertain the young ones, you know, the little ones. To, to keep someone having a good time, you know? Sure, Phantom Menace, in my opinion, is one of the funniest ones. But we still have time to let Jar Jar Binks, like, develop and grow into us. I think at this point in time, hating Jar Jar Binks is a waste of time. Um, I remember seeing on the, uh, on the YouTubes, because obviously I was so little that I, w I wasn't even aware of the news. Um... But, um, seeing the news and seeing that many people were annoyed at Jar Jar Bings, I'm like, you saw, you saw being a little stupid. You saw being a little stupid. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. But anyway, let's get from the uh, uh, Andrew Allen trio, the TIE Fighter attacks from Star Wars. <laughs>
everybody. So you were listening to Kevin Penking and Emmy Evans with the song Composer Diaries and Children's of Magnia. You know, now that we're listening to a little bit of um, Star Wars Vision, um, just so you'll know, this is Got Char Radio and this is your safe space to Star Wars music and other geeky topics. Um, for those of you that are tuning in on Instagram at this point in time. But um, I think that it's it's awesome how different styles, different visions, as it states, states the name of the ontology, Star Wars Vision. Um, they all have a really nice idea, a really nice flow to, to all of it, you know. I honestly think that they should continue doing more of this, having stuff like the Ronin. The Ronin was one of my favorites. Um, I, I read the whole book on audiobook, if you could say that's reading. Um, but the thing is that the Ronin had so many awesome uh, styles of animation. You know, that black and white with the kind of blurry edges and stuff like that for me it was incredible it was really incredible and i think that if we continue doing more star wars vision stuff um maybe um either in the vision style or ontology thing or maybe just do original series that connect the story but using some of the styles from star wars vision could be potentially awesome um I like the ones that were like stop motion style. Those were really good. Um, the first ontology, if you're not aware, was completely anime. They they called a bunch of different uh, anime studios to produce their versions of what they think Star Wars is or what they would have done as a Star Wars uh, show. And they did phenomenal. Twin twin brothers or twin sisters. Ah, that that was great. I think that one was phenomenal for the first uh, installment, you know, the first volume. But for the second volume, I think The Screecher was a really good one. The Screecher was really, really, really out there, you know. it's it's It was one of those uh, ones that reminded me of Gravity Falls for some reason and, and similar to cartoons like Star vs. the Universe and all that. It reminded me of those cartoons but it had its own its own flair, and, and the meanings behind each one of them is just phenomenal. It's just incredible. I think they they should continue doing some more of this, you know. But anyways, let's get a commercial break here for a minute, and uh, let's get ourselves back into the awesomeness. So yeah. <laughs> Greetings, fellow star travelers. This is Andrew Van Zark, your guide through the cosmic wonders of Galactic Travel Radio. Join me in the vast expanse of Star Wars every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 21 hours EST. Embark on a journey with me as we explore the latest news from the Star Wars galaxy in our interstellar breaks. Bask in the glory of epic film scores, mind-bending IDM tracks, hilarious Star Wars parodies, and the thunderous beats of space metal. The force is strong in our musical odyssey, and you won't want to miss it. For exclusive insights and extra content, navigate our star cruiser to www.andrewvanzark.com slash news. And, of course, stay connected on X, formerly known as Twitter, for the freshest updates and behind-the-scenes revelations. Andrew Van Zark on Galactic Travel Radio, through RYE 633, standing by, where the stars are high and the music resonates across the galaxy.
of you wondering, um, why are we playing Ghostbusters music on a Star Wars-centric radio show? Well, if you ask me, you know, if you ask me, it's, it's, it's a soundtrack, you know. We are here for the sci-fi, for the space sci-fi, all in between, you know. Um, even though we are centric to Star Wars, we talk only Star Wars, we can reference other stuff here and there. No, that's no problem, no biggie. Um, and uh, also, I wanted to let you, you all you'll know, now that I can take the chance, if you are around X, a.k.a. Twitter, um, go to my space and you can join in. And if you feel like talking... No pressure. You don't have to. You can also uh, comment on the uh, under the, the post, and I'll be uh, glad to read it. I'll love if you could, you know, join in and maybe have a little chit chat, you know. But again, in this show, even though it is Star Wars centric, we do play other soundtracks here and there. Not all the time, but here and there we do play other soundtracks. Sometimes we play music that. It's not even related to Star Wars. It's not even a soundtrack whatsoever. But it fits correctly. It fits correctly, you know. So, let's just enjoy ourselves and do better, you know. Because every time we we enjoy ourselves some good old nice soundtrack, it reminds us of probably a film we love or a film we hate, you know. So, yeah. Now... Before we continue with the awesomeness, let's listen to Music Legends with Dual Fate. Just let you know, I hear Dula Fates more than I hear you. <laughs> That's all. That's all right. That's all right. There you are. All right. So just so you know, um, my audio is rebroadcasting to my radio station. So you're, you're going to be heard on Blast Radio and on Radio.co and on the official app. So rad. Yeah. Radical, dude. Radical. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Too loud. So, as the title says, uh, I'm impressed that a 25-year-old film was the second to take box office this weekend. Well, I'm not surprised at all. Um, even whether it was Phantom Menace or not, uh, modern Hollywood has been missing so bad that at this point, I feel like, um, not, no, what, what, why am I talking about feelings? Old media is getting a lot of attention. I heard from a friend that Seinfeld was one of the most trending shows on Netflix. I was like, Seinfeld? That's from the 90s. Why is that trending more than any, than anything out right now? It's simple. The quality of modern products just isn't there. Mm-mm. For the most part. I can't say all of it because there's been some real bangers recently, but they're, they're, they're small compared to all the sludge that's been releasing. Oh, for sure. Um, but I, 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 I'm part of the trend of the Seinfeld. I watch Seinfeld almost every afternoon. I know you're saying it's just you know, for every across the Spider Verse, you get the Marvels. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I can't get enough of that Seinfeld. He's he's hilarious. For oh, neither can I. For every everything everywhere all at once, you get Doctor Strange too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, yeah. we do. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny, but no. Um, all all that aside, uh, yeah, no. Seinfeld. Um, he's a classic. He's a classic comedian. He's hilarious. I agree with you. Heck, I've been rewatching the show. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Who's yeah. your favorite character? Ah, uh, George. It used to be um, uh, Kramer. But oh, Kramer. Used to be Kramer. We're rewatching it. George Costanza, for some reason, has hit my number one, and it's not because uh, 
I find his character itself more interesting than the others. It's because the scenarios he gets into are some are, are like the funniest out of all the characters. It's ironically funny. Yeah. And at some at some point, at some extent, I can relate. Yeah, yeah, it's uh It's the most relatable character of them all. Oh really? <laughs> in my opinion it is because you know, we all go through this point in time in our life where like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to do this. I, I think I will. I think I will. Nope. Never mind. It's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. You remember that episode where uh, George Costanza, basically, he, he, he knows his life sucks. So he follows this weird um, bet that he'll do the opposite of everything he usually does in his life. And his life just turns around like crazy. All he had to do was switch his personality and his life was so much better. It's the funniest shit ever. Yep. Uh, and, and, and then it's funny when his wife dies. Yeah. And, and he starts saying that his wife was a model and then it ends up being that all the models he was hitting on saying that this was his wife from the magazine. They were each one of them. And then they find out, and they're like, "Oh no, what are you doing? This, this, that's our picture." Yeah, yeah, no, George. Um, he's desperate. He's a, no, yeah, he is desperate, and uh, it's like I say, you'd be surprised what 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 people do when they're desperate. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and it's funny how his father created a whole holiday. Oh yeah, well it's the world of Seinfeld. So as the show continues, the more wackier it gets, the more sillier it gets. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Heard people argue that the later seasons aren't the best, and I've even heard the infamous finale. I even heard the infamous um, take that the finale isn't good. But I've rewatched those, and I'm like, no, no, I, I think it's still. I think it still holds up. Do I agree that um, the episode they ended on with the finale should have been the finale? No, I actually think they should have like picked some other scenario to. No, I, it's not that I didn't like the episode. I love the episode. I just feel like there should have been like another, maybe an extra episode or three where they go through other scenarios and then do a finale in some other way. But. I, I still think the finale is good quality wise, and I honestly don't see the problem with the later seasons. I guess people prefer, like, I guess maybe a grounded, a more grounded uh, approach, and the early seasons were a bit more grounded than the later ones. I'll, I'll give them, I'll give them that. So yeah, I do think that the earlier seasons are a bit more casual than the, I mean, the the later seasons are more casual than the earlier ones. Oh, really? You think they're more casual? Ah, that's the opposite opinion of a lot of people. Yeah, because uh, on the on the first ones, we're we're still getting to know the the characters. On the later ones, we know the characters, so we're more familiarized with them. We're more, we're, you feel like they're like we're best friends, you know? At the end of the right. day, right? Yeah. There's yeah, I know. Point. Yeah, there's a point in time where I think Jerry's like my best friend. You know, I'm like, oh, I know who you are. Mm-hmm. After enough scenarios, you get used to them. They feel like people you know in your life. Although I'd say Seinfeld is the, ironically, the titular character. He's the most simple out of the, out of the roster. I feel like he's not that complex, which isn't a bad thing. I'm just saying, I feel like, um, after a couple episodes of the beginning of the show, I can already tell the kind of person he is and, you know. For sure. Yeah. Okay. I feel like the most complex one, the mo- the two most complex characters is Kramer and Elaine. I think those mm-hmm. two are very complex because we see them go through some major shifts over the course of the show. Elaine, especially, if if like I had to make a ranking list, uh, but yes. I would say Elaine's probably the most complex character at the very top. Kramer's complex in the sense um, that he's so odd and so um, unique to even the world he takes place in, his character takes place in, that he's an anomaly. And over the course of the show, you slowly start to figure out his logic and how he works, and, you know, you, you love it. 
But Elaine's a different type of complex because she starts out um, fairly friendly, maybe a bit, uh, may- maybe maybe a bit, um, you know, um, frugal and flawed. But over the course of the show, she gets more and more and more deranged and more relentless and more sadistic. And she goes from a fairly normal, nice person with uh, some, you know, maybe some judgmental um, traits to a flat out sadist who honestly um, doesn't feel human anymore. I feel like as the scenarios get more and more ridiculous, the crazier she gets. And I love it. (laughs) Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's scary. Even like I can imagine like I could picture in in a horror story. I I could do it. I could, I, I, I could see her committing a murder, covering it up and acting normal. And no one knows. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's like, funny how she used to date a – was it again a, a communist? Yeah, she used to date a communist. And at the end, she starts acting kind of bad. You think she's going to be kind of communist? Yeah, uh, totally. I could be communist. But not not in the sense of I believe in, communi- in, in the communist party. More in the sense okay. that he has those – Weird uh, psycho traits that most communists uh, have. Well, Elaine, um, I feel like can be influenced by her environment. Not saying she's naive. She's actually fairly clever. But if her emotions are impacted majorly, then you'll start to see her shift in some irrational ways. And I feel like those are coping. Same with George. George has some of the same stuff. The only difference is that with George, it's like pure desperation just to get a chance to make it in life in some way. With Elaine, I feel like it's it's desperation for control. She needs control over herself, and if she feels like she doesn't have that control, she's going to go to any lengths to regain it, even if she does and she doesn't realize it. It's a psychological issue. Yeah, and then and then Jerry's just uh. Crazy one that like I got all these ideas, but you know I, I'm gonna try and keep it grounded, even though I, I'm insane in my own head. Jerry's been called the straight man in this group when it comes to Seinfeld, and I agree, he is the straight man. He is the least crazy out of this group of friends he's in. But what I find interesting about Jerry as a character is that I wouldn't call him. I call him a straight man in this group because everyone else is on some other substances, Kramer especially. But in terms of your average person, Jerry to me is another lunatic. He has, he, he's crazy too, but in his own way, he's a subtle type of crazy. And the subtle type of crazy I'm referring to is his persistence to prove people the type of person he is. His persistence to make people perceive him a certain way leads him to doing extremely irrational, ridiculous things over what he believes to be people judging him. And I honestly think he he, he does forms of emotional manipulation. He does trickery, even with his friends. And... uh I, I'd i say it's slightly unhealthy in the sense that he does it casually. Like, everyone else, they have a breaking point, you know. Kramer, well, not well, not Kramer. Kramer doesn't have a breaking point for the most part. Oh, actually, there are times when he does. But for the most part, he doesn't. But George, Elaine, they have breaking points, and they lose it, and they you start to see how hourly they're acting. And Kramer, he's cool for the most part, but he has his breaking points too, where he starts going even getting going even crazier than he usually is. But Jerry is the one person who does this, who who has this behavior, regardless of what mood he's in. He he do, he doesn't have an off switch. He just keeps on persisting to make people see him a certain way, and it's at an irrational level. And it's a, and if you ask me personally, I think it's a form of insanity. 
Mm-hmm. And the scary thing is that he doesn't need to outwardly show himself snapping in order for you to tell. <laughs> he just does it, and he doesn't stop. No, at all. And, and, and uh, George, if, if we try to analyze him as a person, he's like, like the person that's trying to be one, because there's many episodes where he changes his uh, – career path and one of the things he says it's a architect and he changes to a, a marine biologist and he's trying to fit in somewhere and he's the perfect example of a person trying to fit in but he can't I, do oh uh, yeah no some of those some of those positions you mentioned just now i feel like the fact he could go from an architect to a marine biologist to a sports commentator it's like these are some pretty high positions. And like I know the show and technically everyone, they portray him as a failure, which yeah, he is. But the fact that he's able to push himself to those positions in different ways, I think shows how in a sense how successful he actually is. Not saying that, you know, he's this champion of uh of, of achievement, but the fact that he could even get there failing upwards, I think is impressive. Mm-hmm. And how he was part of the New York Yankees. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, um, so some of those positions you mentioned, I'm like, these are not easy roles to get. Nope, not at all. I don't know how he does it because he keeps failing and he does he doesn't he doesn't even have the best reputation. He's been he's been in so many embarrassing scenarios, I feel like um he kind of ruined his image in the world of Seinfeld by even by the even by the average person. Like his most embarrassing moments are known by so many people in New York. But it's just the fact that despite all of that, he's still able to get these big time careers in some way or form due to his desperation. It's just impressive to me. To- totally, totally. And that 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 this is exactly why I I see George as the character you can most relate to because everybody is trying to be someone. Everybody's trying to fit in somewhere, and even if you fail, you you keep trying to find a way to be someone. Do you think George knows what he wants to be? Because I'm I'm not gonna lie, I don't think George knows what he wants to be personally. No, I, I doubt he knows. I think he just wants to be a successful person. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think George, um, he has hobbies and he tries to base his career off said hobbies, but it's like, I don't think he ever had a set plan and he's willing to jump at whatever, like he said, for success. Mm hmm. And didn't he become like a realtor at the end? I believe so. Yeah, and then he was going to sell a house to Jerry. And Elaine was like, ooh, but I love this house. Come on, give it to me instead. You ever wonder what would have happened if they made more? Like if they made a sequel show of some sort? That that would be amazing, in, in my opinion. But you know what would be more awesome? If they did the same what? thing they did with uh, the, the, fuller, the, the full house, where they did a right. sequel, but instead of just continuing where they left off, just modernized Right, yeah. That seems to be what every show is doing. Even, um, it's been so long since I've, uh, watched it. How long has it been? I'm thinking about this show, uh. Which one? I, I, I can think of iCarly that they did that too. No, yeah, iCarly, well, iCarly, that, that's, that's more of a 2000s show. I'm a 2000s kid, so yeah, that's my era. But yeah, no, they brought iCarly back. But I'm, I'm referring to a show that's much older, um, Fraser, yeah, Fraser. Even Fraser got a got to come back. They even gave Fraser a show taking place when he's like older and he and his son's an adult. So even Fraser gets to come back. So at this point, all these sitcoms are getting sequels that take place in the modern day. Why not Seinfeld? Exactly. Imagine Seinfeld old with an iPhone or that would be funny. And then and then all of a sudden he accidentally gets an OnlyFans request. What the hell? I mean, look, considering the fact that Jerry Seinfeld plays himself, Jerry Seinfeld, um, 
I just like, and this is a personal thing, not, not saying this is actually happening, but I just like to assume that every live action show where Jerry Seinfeld is showing off his cars or doing some celebrity thing, I just assume that this is basically the sequel to his show. Like he's just some big time actor celebrity, like he is in the real world. And, um, in the world of Seinfeld, this is where he is as an older person. Like, I, in my head, I just imagine that, cause it's Jerry Seinfeld, yeah. on and off camera, you know. <laughs> you know? And then the paparazzis are just, you know, people trying to get a, a cameo of his life. Yeah. That's what I like about, um, older com- comedic celebrities. Um, some of them, you know, have a character they're most well known for and it's a different name. We have those certain comedic celebrities where they just play themselves in a movie or show and, you know, it's like, it feels even more authentic because when you follow their career after that movie or those movies or shows are done, you're like, oh, it's, it's still Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> He's still here. Yep. You know? It's like Jim Carrey. Yeah, well, I, I don't know um, what movie or show Jim Carrey uh, did where he was Jim, where he was just Jim Carrey. But I can't think of any. Um, I, I, I've seen this TikTok that she imitates uh, Jim Carrey perfectly, equally as Jim Carrey is, and she studied completely Jim Carrey's life, and Jim Carrey acts the same way as he does in films and in, in the real. Kind of reminds me of. Uh, when Jim Carrey improv this Andy Kaufman for Man on the Moon. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, no, no, because when you told me she, uh, when you told me, I, I don't know who you're referring to, when you told me she basically um, copied Jim Carrey like in, in every way, I'm like, oh, so like how Jim Carrey copied Andy Kaufman in every way. Mm-hmm. To get the spirit. Although Jim Carrey and... Look, this is, you can decide whether you believe him or not. I said a man in the moon, he claimed to be actually possessed by the ghost of Andy Kaufman. There's even uh, a moment with Andy's daughter where he has this heartfelt discussion with Andy's daughter and uh, basically uh, pretends to be Andy Kaufman. And uh, honestly, I'm I'm one who believes in the supernatural, so... I'm not going to say that, you know, this, that there's no way, but despite my belief in the supernatural, I have a strong feeling personally that either Jim was improving like crazy or he had some type of psychological snap. I'm I'm pretty sure it's the second one, a psychological snap. You don't think the ghost of Andy Kaufman actually possessed Jim's body for Man on the Moon? (laughs) Probably, and that's what got him to get the psychological snap. <laughs> you think it's both? Yeah. You think the ghost was there, and he's actually crazy. It's fucking both. That's hilarious. I'm pretty, you know what? I agree with you. He was fighting him to, like, get out, get the hell out of my body. You know, honestly, why not? I, I honestly think if ghosts possess you, you, you will go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah. That would have been crazy. But hey, uh, this is all the time I have in my radio show. So thank you for uh, coming by. Um, at some point, I'll have a edited version of, of the radio show so you can listen to Spotify or Apple Podcast. Awesome. It was um, awesome being on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, if you want, you can download the app and you can listen to the uh, radio station 24-7 on Google Play or App Store. And there is an on-demand section and you can find some of the recorded versions. You got it. And also, thanks. And also, last thing, I'm also a musician, and I upload music to every major music platform. Oh, I, I already know that. We've we've talked before. I know. I know your. I know your musical past. <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be a new song coming out this summer. What's it going to be called? Radical hit. Ooh, sounds fancy. It is radical. Radical hits. I, I don't know. I'm excited. Yeah. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being awesome. And may the force be with you. May the force be with you too. Always. All right. Bye. Sayonara. Sayonara.
Space Rock Slash Metal, IDN, Cheap Tunes, Soundtracks, Star Wars, Games, Galactic Reflections, and Galactic Radio, 91.7 FM. Iron is new with power, power to the music. Unite for the sound revolution in Galactic Jaguar Radio. Support Anna Razark's original tunes, the polls of our online radio station, and keep the news blazing like Beskar. Click, donate, and hit that PayPal button, and join the watch. Keep the tunes alive. This is the way.